So, uh, who are you? Uh, I'm Marcus Tannis. And this is a famous room. That's true. What, what goes on in this room? So in this room, we have... Other than there's a liquid nitrogen tank <laughs> here, which we'll talk about. Yes, in this room, we have two um, um, instruments, so-called um, scanning tunneling microscopes, which allows us to image and to manipulate um, atoms and molecules on the, really on the, on the fundamental scale. And we've seen this, the work of this room on TV, right? I, I saw the IB, IBM's uh, logos spelled out in individual right. atoms. Right. And that was done right here. Right? That was right done here, right. That's okay. true. So uh, why the liquid nitrogen? So the liquid asking? nitrogen is just, I mean, we have to, 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 to measure and to manipulate um, atoms. We have to bring them um, to a very low temperature yeah. because they're usually they're just um, flying around and running around, and we want to have them calm. So no. that's why we need them. Uh, that's why we need, yes, take the model. Explain it's that's heavy. very heavy. <laughs> yeah. So this is just a little model. So, so atoms, if they're at room temperature, are doing this? Yes, they are really, they are really fast. So we cool them down so that they stay on, on, uh, on the surface where we want to have them. And, and see, to most lay people, that seems pretty incredible, right? Because you look at a piece of equipment, like a keyboard or whatever, and we don't see that movement, right? No, we don't see that. And we can't perceive it because these vi these atoms right now are vibrating, and we right. we can't perceive that, right? Right. But what we can do, we can cool them down, and then we have. Uh, so I will explain you how how our microscope works okay. in a very basic uh, sense. So we have a very sharp metal tip. So that's just uh, this little uh, yeah. thing here, and then we just. Would you like to put the atom down? So then we just <laughs> use it like a. Our instrument works similar like a old record player. So if you have a needle and then a record player, the needle is uh, just uh, following the groove and gives you the, mu the music, right? Yeah. So we do something similar. We're just moving the, the tip over the surface, and it actually just feels when there's an atom, and it has to move a little bit away. So that's the way that we get images. And if you want, I show you this in, in line. Um, so that's the machine is just running. And if I just press uh, My arm is a little excited. Then you, you will see. This is now real data which uh, just comes in and you see there's a surface. And it's that fast the tip is moving down right. row by row that it's fast? row by row and then it's just images. And what we see here is is one atom which is this mountain there. Um, or maybe two atoms. <laughs> <laughs> so you see that's what, how we can um, image um, the atoms. Wow. What material is that? That is actually copper and on top of this copper is an uh, iron atom. Yeah. So, other than having fun and being able to put people's logos in atoms and stuff like that, what, what is this research used for? What, what are you hoping to learn with these machines? And what kinds of things are you trying to actually do scientifically rather than just fun and TV? Right, TV right, right. <laughs> so, I mean, um, first from the scientific point of view, these are the smallest bricks we have in our um, uh, two, two to play with. So, I mean, at least in, uh, in, uh, in our environment as we, we know them from the daylight, day life, because um, every material is um, a bit out of uh, single atoms or then molecules and so on. So we are studying the, the properties of these um, atoms. Yeah. For example, what we can do, we can understand uh, their magnetism. And there then comes IBM into the game, because um, we are interested in understanding if it's possible to use a, a single atom, or maybe just a few of these atoms, to uh, perform data storage or to perform computation. And that's why you're playing with an iron atom, because right. an iron you see atom it. can be magnetized. You see it. You see it. That's exactly the reason why we use iron. We try to use iron. Actually, we have already found out that 
one ion atom is not, you can't um, um, store information in this because due to the quantum mechanic nature of um, the, the atoms we are studying, they are not completely, um, so there's a possibility that they have um, their magnetism um, up and down at the same time and that's actually happening this one ion atom. So how many do you need? Hmm? How many do you need? Do you, have you found it? No, we haven't found this yet. So, but um, let's say it's clear that we know from other experiments, from other groups, that uh, if you go to a, to a number like 10,000, 100,000, then they behave like your little um, magnet you have on your kitchen fridge. So, we want to study how many of them you need to get um, magnetism really working, to get maybe to, to use them as data storage, wow. for data storage. Is there another material that you could use instead of iron? Oh yeah, there are, of course. I mean, there are um, hundreds of different atoms. So we are trying also to combine them, for example, to use iron and cobalt or iron and manganese as a combination to figure out if this works maybe better. Wow. Now, my sponsor is Seagate, and they've shown me how they got more data per square inch by, by putting the magnets head to, on top of each other like a forest right. of trees rather than laying them down, right? Because the early magnets, like the first hard drive that's out, out here, in, in fact, that was invented here too. Right. They laid the magnets, you know, it was actually just it material played. sprayed out <laughs> from a coffee cup, right? <laughs> <Is that whatever? laughs> it was really, really hardcore, small science back then. But um, by sticking them up, you get more density. Are you studying that kind of stuff too, like how to arrange things? Um, yes, but on a different level because, I mean, uh, these magnets um, Hitachi and all other companies are using, they are still quite large. So they are containing millions and tens of millions of atoms. So they are really, really um, classical big magnets. So we are uh, studying more uh, single atoms. So atoms, of course, they, they are, if you want, round. So, but the question is, of course, how can we arrange them? So maybe, let's say, maybe they have to be in a line or maybe they have to be arranged in a triangle. And these are questions we have, of course, too, to, to find the geometrical, how to geometrically arrange them to get the properties we want to have. And um, if you're successful, what, will we see like a 10 times increase in, in uh, data per square inch? Or, well, or I mean... 100 times, you know, what it, today we have, uh, what, an 80 gig drive on an iPod, right? Right. So are we going to see like a terabyte drive on an iPod if you're successful? Well, I mean, that's of course hard to say because um, first of all, we are at the very beginning and we haven't uh, proceeded to, to, we haven't managed to store information at this level. And if we manage to do this, then of course, we are still working at very low temperature, not in the, the temperature you want to have, not at room temperature. So you'd, ha you'd have to carry around the yeah, yes, liquid that's, nitrogen. That's, <laughs> and, you have, and you have your giga, gigabit um, hard drive, but you have to carry liquid nitrogen with you, so that's not really what you want. So it will take time, but at the end, it might be then really, an, a, really a revolution in data storage, um, because this is really um, um, much smaller than everything which exists today, and this is more like thousand times um, smaller than what, had, um, what happens today. Wow. So that's really would be a revolution and it would be the end of the story because past atoms there's nothing you can do in uh, at room temperature and normal conditions yeah. because then uh, this would be the final end of um, where you can go with smaller data storage. Wow. Now you, um, along this, uh, this corridor here you guys are also studying properties of electrons, right? right. And before uh, we were able to measure their charge, I mean, or do things with the charge, right? That's what a transistor does, right? Right. You guys are actually measuring the spin of the electron. Right. Explain, explain it and what you're trying to study on. So on just the, to be sure, I mean, that's called spintronics. You, you, I saw, I'm reading the posters as I'm right, walking back. Right. Right. So that's this, 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 this. Oh, nice. since you guys were leaving the posters. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, if you just look to the image, yeah. this happens due to uh, that there are electrons and that there's current. So between the tip and the surface, there's a little tiny current flowing, and that's our regulation. So that's why we know, where we know that we are close to the surface. So this works with just with electrons and with uh, the, the charge they have. So, but it was found here in this lab, and it's not so long ago, just a couple of years ago, that actually with this instrument, you can also um, detect if the spin of such an atom um, flips. So I mean, the spin is just uh, like 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 an, another property, like the magnetic property, and it can flip from one state to the next state. And you can detect this with this instrument. So that's our way how we can actually 
um, say something about the spin. Can you control the spin externally? Um, yes. So we can. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. My my viewers might know like the uh, Amazon Kindle book reader or the Sony ebook reader actually uses black balls that spin, right? Like that right. to show an image on the screen. But that's a lot bigger. But could you actually control an atom that way and, and actually detect whether it's upside down or right side up? So we have a, for us, very easy way to, to, to change um, 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 the spin properties. Just we switch on a magnetic field. So that's like you do it on your hard drive. You have also a little head which just uh, applies a magnetic field to, to flip the, the bits of your hard drive. So we do the same thing. We have a magnetic field and we just study how the spin changes if you apply a magnetic field. And in the end, of course, we want to have some structure where we can just apply a magnetic field. We switch it on. We switch the magnetic field off and the data is, um, is, is stored in this structure. Wow. There's not many labs in the world doing this kind of research, is there? Do you know of any others? Or? Yes, of course, we are, we are in, a, in, 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 a, in a lot of contact with other labs, and we have uh, visitors from other labs which uh, stay here for months even um, just to work with us. So there are really, there are not so many labs, but there's um, maybe a, a good um, half dozen labs which do similar stuff, and we are in, 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 in an exchange of this. This is not. Actually, which is very nice uh, from the scientific point of view, that is so advanced and so far away from products that we are really open. We can share our information and we can discuss, we can go to conferences, and really we don't have to hide um, our research uh, due to the that we want to have a product next year. Yeah. This won't happen. Yeah. Um, I know I have a lot of high school students who watch my videos. If you're in high school, how do you get to be? working here in this lab. You know, it's probably eight years from now, but I, if you wanted to join IBM Research and be in this lab doing this kind of research, because this is going to be going on for quite a while. <coughs> That's true. going to end next week. <laughs> but, you know, I remember very well that I saw these, these image you mentioned um, earlier, these um, IBM atoms. Uh, so atoms r used to write IBM on just a piece of surface. I saw it when I was just out of high school and I said, well, this is amazing. This is really great. I couldn't imagine, this is almost um, um, 18 years ago, I couldn't imagine to be today here in this lab. So it's actually um, not so difficult. You just have to be open-minded and interested and, and uh, try to, to look around. And it, it looks like magic, but actually it is not magic. Yeah. It is uh, really um, um, work um, we can do. Yeah. And also, if you are a high school a student and you are interested in this, then uh, just uh, try to be uh, top in math and science, right? Well, you have to be um, you have to be interested in science, of course. Otherwise, it's a little bit hard. But um, I personally would say that my math skills are average and not more. So this is not uh, you don't have to be perfect in everything. <coughs> it's a, it's a great team in all labs, and um, it's a it's not a one. Um, person a job. So if you just work, want to work completely alone for yourself, then you're not for this field. Tell me about the team who's standing around behind us. Hopefully Rocky can... Uh, yeah. So who else is here? That's uh, Chris Lass. That's, um, he's um, the longest guy. I'm not. <laughs> he is <laughs> longest in the lab um, since, I don't know, since 20 years? Yeah, I've been here uh, yeah. since 1990. 1990? Yeah. Oh, and. Um, so uh, I came in at, at shortly after the first microscope uh, was moving atoms and positioning individual atoms at yeah. known locations. So and that was so done in 89, right? That's right. Yeah. And who was the, the guy who did that, that original was, research? That was Don Eigler and Erhard Schweitzer he was working with. And that was right here at, right here? at this location. So he sat right here? And uh, I joined his team and, uh, and kicked him out. And <laughs> What's he doing now? <laughs> He's, uh, he's on sabbatical at Harvard right now, so he's deciding what the next great thing to do is. So he's looking into it, how to use his skill. Yeah, yeah I'm Sebastian Lohr, and I just arrived here a few weeks ago. Um, I come from Germany originally. He's and <laughs> oh, and so I'm, I'm still learning to speak English. <laughs> Your English is a lot better than my German, so we better stick with English. <laughs> okay, let's try that. Um, and. Yeah, I'm finished with my PhD, or I have just finished my PhD, and I have the great opportunity to be here and do some research here. So, yeah, it's basically, um, I just made the step to, to get into this lab and yeah. 
Yeah. Now, you, now your career is just starting. How how much of your career do you think you're going to be doing this kind of research? Yeah, it depends how long I may stay here. Yeah. <laughs> when, when I get kid, uh, kicked out here. <laughs> um, We're I, always going to need things smaller, even if we get yeah. a terabyte in your iPod, of right? Course. You're, of you're, course. You're going to want 10 terabytes then, or 100 yeah. terabytes. So, um, yeah, it's in, at the moment I'm here on a scholarship, and that's for a year. So, yeah, just started, and <laughs> let's see what this year brings. You, I wonder if in, in his career he's going to see the end of Moore's Law. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> you don't think so? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you going to bet your career on that? <laughs> we'll talk in 40 years, right? No. <laughs> I mean, um, that's how science goes. There's every, if, and every time when you reach at some point, you see something else that you don't understand and say, hey, wow, what's that? Let's look into that. And I think that's the basic principle that drives Moore's Law. And if we would sometime finally reach the, the size that we store information in one atom, then there will be someone who asks, well, can't we go beyond that? Can't we go into the nucleus of an atom or do something completely different we can't even think of at the moment? And do, so do I don't think Moore's law will end. I think it, it <laughs> might slow down a bit. Do that might happen, but... Do atoms have metadata? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that. <laughs> yeah, <we laughs> Look into the fire then. <laughs> so. um, well, I mean, what I definitely would like to point out is that it's a lot of fun yeah. to play with atoms, and uh, it's a great opportunity to be here and uh, to have this possibility and to do something which is really interesting. And um, yeah, that is uh, something I would like to say. Okay. <laughs> Well, cool. Thank you so much for uh, giving us a little tour here. Um, are we actually going to be able to put any uh, atoms down today? So we can try it. I can't guarantee it. Just a second. So we there. Minus it's also wrong. Then we want to add... Plus two. Eight. Number of not working. So how did they find you? <laughs> I applied here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> said, hey, please let me come. <laughs> Okay. So what are we seeing here? So we see now a um, different part of the, of, the, of, the, of the surface. What's the, the surface material then? The surface material is copper. Okay. Um, it's a facet of the copper crystal. Right. And now you see some kind of like um, three, four, five, um, maybe six atoms. So what you see here, these, these bumps here, so that's now a top view. So what is dark is lower, and what is bright is higher, and these, these pink lines are just um, height lines. Like a topographical map. Like a topographical map. Just to say that this has a size of 5 times 5 nanometer. So uh, billions of, uh, of a meter is a nanometer. So that is very, very <laughs> tiny. So, and, um, so we had to change the, the position of where we were scanning because it's real, it's real life. And uh, so we will try now to pick up an atom and place it to a different spot. So, and for this, we use a mouse. So now you see the scanner is no longer scanning. This line has stopped, and I can with this little cross. I don't know if this is visible. Yep. Um, I can move the tip wherever I want. Yep. Right. right. Here. So now I put it on top of this atom, almost on top of the atom, and now I just um, apply two clicks. And hopefully, I have picked it up now. So you see, see, the image has slightly changed. Yeah. yeah. And hopefully, this atom is now gone. So what actually happened is that we picked <laughs> up the the atom on the end of the tip. So now it's on at the end of the tip. Now, how, okay. So where's where's the tip? Where's the tip? Yeah. It's like this. So, so we have the surface <laughs> here. And what we did, we are usually just scanning and imaging the surface. And now what we did, we moved closer to the surface. And Come on, and we picked up the last, the atom on the surface. So now we have, uh, we are scanning with this tip, the surface again with this last atom, and now we will try to bring it back to the surface. So that to pick that up, I mean, do you applying a magnetic charge? I mean, obviously there's it's an electron electrical, electrical charge. Yeah, that's so that is what we have to do to pick it up. And now I have to invert the, the, the direction of the current. And just do this quickly, and then hopefully we um, get the atom, and we get the atom back to the surface. 
So let me try to put it back here. So to spell the IBM logo took a few hours to do. It took, um, if I remember correctly what uh, Don Eigler, who did this, um, told me it took something like 20, uh, 22 hours or so. Oh. And so, um, and um, because it happens like, like it happens here now, so we try to put it back, but it's not, it's, um, not it's not, it's still on the tip. So it's not always um, working as you, as you want to have it. So you have to have patience, patience. and uh, really uh, try it. And it's, um, if, but if it's once, if it's really working, so that you have a stable tip and everything works fine, then you just do it. And we are now faster. If we would uh, write IBM now, if you give us a, um, if the system is running fine, then it's just uh, maybe an hour or so to write it down. But still, it's very slow if you want to um, use this technique as to product, uh, to produce some uh, some stuff in a, on a production level. That's not not uh, useful for that. So that gives you an idea of how slow this science is, right? Yeah. Because yeah, if you're going to try triangles or hexagon, hexagonal, hexagon. you know, hexa <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rocky. Hexagons. <laughs> Hexagons, and, you know, you're going to have to draw those, and that'll take quite a bit of time. And then you have to test it, whether your theories were correct. And that's then right. if they're not correct, you have to try it again, right? Right. Wow. So. But. That's, uh, that's, that's why he has a job for life, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's true. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely not uh, stopping so fast with uh, the knowledge we get from that. Yeah. So still, each day we, we learn something new. Now, the, the uh, tunneling microscope, is that going to eventually become faster, or, or is the tool set going to become easier where you can move groups of Yes, yes, so? yes. I mean, it is definitely um, um, already now, in the last um, 25 years since it has, was invented, it's uh, becoming, let's say, more powerful. It's not always a question if you want to be fast. I mean, we want to be slow because we are slow as an as, as, as a, as a operator. But um, in other fields where it's much more important to, to, be, to, be, to get a fast image, and maybe not on the atomic scale, it has already, already involved uh, um, um, into instruments which are much faster, which work at room temperature, which, is, which are so easy to use that uh, really, um, I mean, you just read a five-page manual and you can use it. So these machines exist. Um, of course, they have done other limitations, and we don't mind that it takes us a long time to, to, to build structures, because we, are not, we don't want to have uh, just a button to, to have the computer doing this, which you could imagine. We want to do it by ourselves, and we want to study this. So we don't mind that it takes time. Now, uh, when we actually get a look at the microscope, there's a lot of aluminum foil, and yes. even an aluminum can from yes. a soft drink can. I what is that doing? Why do you need to do that? So that's really funny because that's a, that's a question we got, of course, often. So the point is we want to have not only that um, everything is cold, so that nothing is moving around, we want to have it also clean. So, and to get it clean, we use pumps to get a really high, good vacuum. But on the walls of our chambers, there's a lot of dirt, especially water. So what do you do to get the water off? You heat it up. So we are just baking the whole system. But we don't want to have uh, baking temperature in this room, so we use aluminum foil, like you would use it in your, in your kitchen, to, to shield the heat on the system and not to get all the heat uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the room. That is just uh, the, the reason. And of course, we wrap it all in aluminum foil, and at the end of the day, we are happy, but we are just removing the parts we need to remove. So that's why there is uh, forever this foil, um, this tin foil, um, around, wrapped around. Well, thank you very much. It's Thanks been again. a real pleasure. Thank you very much.